Hey everybody, we're gonna dive into the book of Revelation. Uh, I'm gonna do chapter by chapter, uh, maybe even section by section. Just go through it and try to help uh, make it uh, more accessible to a lot of you. There's a lot of intimidation about the book of Revelation. Um, so I think this is gonna be very valuable and uh, will help your understanding and help you to see the picture that it's maybe a lot simpler uh, than you realize. There are two kinds of uh, people that I would like to um, address first, and that is those of you that believe that um, there has to be a very complicated schema involved in interpreting Revelation, that you have to pull this piece out here and put that in there, and it takes you know, years and years of study to finally understand. Um, that isn't really how God operates. He gave this word for all believers to be able to understand. I do believe it takes the right eyes to see, but it's not complicated, as, as we'll see. You just have to understand symbolism. That's it. Uh, also, there are believers who would like to approach Revelation with uh, as a very symbolic uh, document, that it's all symbolism of spiritual things in the spiritual realm that really doesn't relate to anything on earth. That's not true. This is a, a book that is telling us about the future of us, of what's coming on the earth. It's not spiritual uh, only. Um, there's also a group of believers that, that believe, that would say that the, the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled, <clears throat> that the symbolism is tied to Roman emperors, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, other events of the Empire of Rome, I would challenge that um, and ask, at what point did it stop being fulfilled historically, and now are we waiting for future events, and why? Because clearly, at the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus returns, and there's judgment, etc. And those events of the end haven't happened yet. There's supernatural things described, uh, judgments that have not happened yet, didn't happen in ancient Rome, or now. So, if you're interpreting it that way, you are uh, intentionally only reading a few things from the book, trying to find a historical explanation for them, and then you're dismissing all the things that clearly didn't happen and haven't happened yet. I don't think any of those approaches are correct. I think we just need to read it, trust that it is talking about a lot of things in the future, and try to understand it. So that's what we're going to do. So let me start reading, and uh, I'll uh, comment as we go. So in uh, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. So first, this word revelation, that's pretty clear. You may have heard the word apocalypse. Apocalypse is, is the Greek name of this book, which is apocalypsis, and it just means revelation. It means a vision, you know, things that have been revealed. Notice that God the Father gave this revelation to Jesus, the Son, to reveal to us. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Now, angels are created beings. They are pictured often with wings, but there's different kinds of angels in heaven, and we're not going to go into that at this time. But also note that the word angel in Greek means messenger. And in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word was messenger his servant John. Now, John is the apostle, the disciple John. He was one of the original 12 disciples. John, who bore witness to the word of God and, that, and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. That is referring to the fact that John walked with Jesus while Jesus was on earth, that he was one of the original disciples. That is what John is saying here. He says that he bore witness to the word of God. He saw Jesus in person. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So this is the only book of the Bible that God promises a blessing if you read it and keep the words in it. So Revelation is not only revealing what's coming, but it is a challenge. It's an exhortation to us to follow God more closely and to pursue righteousness, to live according to his will. So, um, but it promises a blessing on those who read it and do it. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, 
Now, seven in the Bible is the number of completion. It means something is complete. So when it says seven churches, which are in Asia, now Asia is modern day Turkey. Uh, that's what it's referring to. It was a Roman province. Turkey in the days of the Roman Empire was called Asia. That was, uh, well, it had many province, sub provinces within it, but that territory was called Asia by the Romans. Um, so John is saying this is this book, this is a message that Jesus is sending to seven specific churches, which we'll see in future chapters in the land of Turkey. But the word seven, seven, the number seven is included to say that this message is really for the complete church. It's not just for these literal seven churches, but it's for all churches in all times. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. This is a phrase that will be repeated in Revelation often. Who is, who was, and who is to come. Past, present, and future. God knows the past, he knows the present, and he knows the future. He is in all three at the same time. We are the only ones who are subject to time. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Okay, now that is a curious phrase because seven spirits, we know the Holy Spirit um, is part of God. I mean, the, this is the concept of the Trinity that is difficult uh, for us humans to understand, but God has revealed himself in three persons. And whether this is, uh, th but this is referring to the Holy Spirit, but it uses a plurality and uses the number seven to indicate that it is the complete Holy Spirit. Now, I know that might sound strange, but I think the intention is to say that the Holy Spirit, that all, the, 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 the complete heart of God, so to speak, power, mercy, judgment, peace, love, forgive, all of it is seen in this book. I believe that is what it's saying. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now, so this is from God the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. We see those three titles here. And for um, these titles are important, okay? So for all of the, uh, any believer, any Christians watching this, let these titles elevate your view of Jesus and his role. For those uh, of you who are Jewish, who uh, remember that John is Jewish. John was a faithful Jew who wrote this book, and he's giving these kind of titles to Jesus. For those of you who are Muslim, and you say that Esau, Jesus, is just another prophet. He's an important prophet in Islam, but you believe he's just a prophet. Pay attention to these titles that God gives him. And for those of you who are atheists, I would say it, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. It's only a matter of time before you recognize it one way or the other. And the words of this book um, hopefully will, will sink in. But the title, The Faithful Witness, this means that Jesus is testifying about things. Things he's seen, things he knows. Things he's seen in the Father, things he knows of the Father, things he knows of heaven, truths that he knows that we need to understand. And when he does give this testimony to us, he's faithful, the faithful witness. Everything he says to us is true. And we can trust it, you can take it to the bank. The firstborn from the dead, second title. A great honor, this is referring to the resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead and at the time he rose from the dead, there were others, Old Testament saints, that the Bible says rose from the dead as well, as witness to what was happening. Um, but Jesus was the firstborn of all of those to be resurrected. This is a promise to the rest of us. The Bible promises that the rest of us who grow old and die, you know, we're going to be resurrected. We're going to uh, rise up. We're going to be flesh put back on our bones, and we're going to be given glorified bodies. This is the promise of the resurrection. And because Jesus is a faithful witness, we can trust it. 
the fact that he himself was raised from the dead um, is proof of his claims. It is God, through his power, honoring Jesus and validating uh, what the Jesus came from him. Now, some of you say, well, that's just a myth. You know, we can't really trust that Jesus rose from the dead. That's what the Bible says. So there's some great books you can read. The Case for Christ uh, by Lee Strobel or More Than a Carpenter. Uh, I believe that was by Josh McDowell. Very simple books. They talk about some of the evidences for the resurrection. Um, I think Lee Strobel has another book called The Case for Easter uh, that focuses exclusively on the resurrection. But when it comes down to it, Jesus was a public figure. External, non-biblical Roman documents mention him. Roman historians mention him, so we know he existed. And these Roman documents say he was killed on a cross. To be killed by a cross means the Roman authorities executed him. Um, we know that it was the leadership of both the Romans and the Jewish people who, of Israel who wanted him dead because of various reasons. This is not saying Jews wanted that. We all killed Jesus through our sin. But we know that the leadership at the time are the ones that put him to death from jealousy, from for blasphemy, for whatever reason you want to give. But he was a public figure executed. And the leadership at the time, his enemies, said, we know that he's claimed he's going to rise from the dead. And they asked the Romans to put guards on the tomb to protect the body so that that could not be said. Now, days later, the Bible says that the there was an earthquake and the stone was rolled away and, and uh, Jesus rose from the dead. And the body was no longer there. Now, my question to you is, if he did not rise from the dead, where's the body? You say, well, it's 2,000 years. How are we going to know? Where's the body? Why wasn't it produced back then? There's two groups. There's the disciples and there's the enemies of Jesus. If the body was discoverable, and then wouldn't his enemies, the Pharisees, wouldn't they have produced it to say, look, he's not alive. Here's his body or the Romans. The enemies would have produced it. So that doesn't make sense. The disciples, on the other hand, so then the, then the argument, well, the disciples stole it and they made up this mythology surrounding Jesus. Yet every single one of these disciples died for this claim that Jesus rose from the dead. All they had to do, each one of them, was say, hey, we, we made it up. Sorry, we were just trying to pull a fast one. We wanted to do this little cult thing and, uh, um, you know, get some money or whatever it was. So you don't have to kill us now. We're admitting it. That's all any one of them had to do. Yet all of them went to their death, proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead and they had seen him. Now, if they knew the body had been stolen, why would you die for a lie? And if they were just missing the body, but hadn't seen him risen from the dead, would they still die for that? Very unlikely. Only if they were personally convinced by having seen Jesus themselves would they have done that. And so Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, and we have a real promise that we can trust. And the ruler over the kings of the earth, and that's what we're going to see throughout this book, that these presidents and and uh, leaders and even the Pope himself and, and uh, communist leaders of China, you name it, Kings, whoever, they're all subject to the power and rulership of Christ. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests and God. So now we have received a great honor. He is raising us up to govern in the future, both as king and priest. We don't deserve this but we receive it because he is great and merciful and gracious and has given us great gifts we don't deserve. You know, the definition of grace is receiving what you do deserve, what you don't deserve. It's about getting gifts that you don't deserve. And that is one. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. 
and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Again, more titles. Alpha, the Alpha and the Omega. So the Alpha, Alpha was the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So this is talking about Jesus being the beginning and the end of everything. And, uh, and again, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So he is the beginning, he is the end. He is past, present, and future, and he is all-powerful. All right, so we're going to stop there for this video because I don't want these videos to be too long. Um, and uh, that was through verse 8. So we're going to continue with verse 9.